what I want to do today is tell you about an area I've been working on research-wise for the last year or two. I'm a labor economist. I study, uh, I've studied things like why firms use stock options and how graduating during a recession affects the rest of your career for if you're an MBA. Class of 87, right? Yeah, you guys are rich. The guys a year or two later, they're out of luck. Still. <laughs> still to this day, but that's another story. What I want to talk to you today about is the gig economy. And as a, as a labor economist, I'm very interested in this. I've been doing research using the sorts of data sets labor economists use all the time from the Census Bureau and places like that. But um, I've also been very lucky to have some companies that handed, some gig economy companies that handed over data and asked, either asked me to do some work with it or have open themselves up as laboratories that we can study for research projects. So I'll tell you a little bit about some of that as we uh, go along. And um, then, but mostly, or at least a good portion of what I want to talk about is you guys are managers, you're business people. I want to think about, well, what does this mean to you as managers? What's the gig economy all about? Strategic, I teach strategy classes here, and I'm going to at least spend a little time thinking about, well, what does this have to do with the strategy of your business? So, Anybody who reads the newspaper has heard a lot about the gig economy, Uber, all these other companies. And it probably has had a lot more influence in the press than in the actual real world. But it is definitely a growing part of our business. And we, as labor economists, want to understand it going forward. So to inspire the discussion of the gig economy, let me tell you about three participants in the gig economy. This is a guy named Alexei. I love giving this talk because Alexei is in the middle of U the Ukraine right now, and he has no idea that 100 people or however many here in Stanford are looking at a picture and discussing him. But this is just a guy who does computer software engineer. He lives in a place in the Ukraine that I certainly wouldn't try to pronounce. This is his, this is his profile on a website called Upwork. Upwork is the largest online freelancing platform in the world. This guy, you can hire him now to do some web development for you or other things like that. And he will do it for you, charge you $25 an hour. He has great ratings. He's done a lot of work. He's very successful. He's selling his work to people here in the United States. It's opened up an opportunity for him to make money beyond his parents' wildest dreams because they could only sell their labor in the Ukraine. They couldn't sell it to Americans with a lot more money to spend on it. Okay. This is a different guy, a very different perspective on the gig economy. I don't know his name. He's in a newspaper article in Bloomberg. This guy lives up in Sacramento. He drives for Uber. At the beginning of each week, he drives down from Sacramento to the Bay Area, spends four or five days in the Bay Area driving 14 hours a day for Uber, spends the night sleeping in the Marina, San Francisco Marina Safeway parking lot in his car. Now, I don't know if you guys are like me. When you read a newspaper article, you feel like they leave out the important parts. They never explain what he does about showering. I'm dying to know that. <laughs> but OK, on the more substantive issues, he's making more money because he comes, to, he comes to the Bay Area to do his Uber driving instead of doing it up in Sacramento. And it's much more lucrative here. He stays busier. The surge rates are higher, all sorts of stuff like that. So both of these guys are gig economy success stories. And what's interesting about them is, and this isn't true of the entire gig economy, is from a broader labor economics perspective, they're immigration stories. The gig economy is enhancing immigration. How? Well, what are both of these people doing? They're both doing exactly what Americans, I mean, sorry, people who've moved to the United States have been doing for hundreds of years. They're taking their, ser they're taking their services, selling them in the United States, and then taking at least some of the money and sending it back home. Now, Alexei doesn't even have to move here to do that. He's an Im Upwork is an immigration platform just as much as it is an actual workplace, workplace platform. Uber is less of an immigration platform, but it's exactly the same story. Immigrant, the guy comes down from Sacramento, works in a higher wage area, brings the money home, and his family is better off as a result of it. So those are kind of, we're going to talk about other stories, but those are two perspectives. Let me tell you about a third perspective on the gig economy. When I do a research project, I like to really get embedded in it. So I've been doing some driving for Uber on the side. It doesn't pay very well, so I'm probably going to stick with the whole Stanford thing. But, 
But I have learned an incredible amount about, in, in the process of it. It's been very helpful for the research project that I'm doing. It's, it's been very interesting in many ways. There on the side, you can see I have a really good rating. I'm very proud of that. Someday I'm going to find that guy who gave me four stars and he's in trouble. <laughs> um, and then the other thing to notice is you don't see this as an Uber rider on the right. That's, the, that's from the app for the driver. And that tells me those red areas are the surge. So that tells you where you can go to make more money. So sometimes we'll be sitting around at dinner and it drives my fiance crazy. We'll just be sitting there and I'll go, she'll go, okay, well, what are we doing you know, after dinner? I'll go, look at the search, gotta go. And <laughs> okay, so what are we gonna talk about about the gig economy? She's actually in the room, and, uh, so, but that's neither here nor there. So uh, anyway, these are the things I want to cover pretty quickly here. I want to talk about some facts from the gig economy, segmenting the gig economy. I want to think about why it's grown. And then I want to tell you about a study. I'm briefly about the study I'm doing at Uber, not about my own earnings at Uber. And then I want to save some time to talk about, as managers, what does all this matter to you? So I did a study for Upwork. Upwork asked me to use a survey they conducted and their own data to look at the gig economy and talk about the state of the gig economy. In that paper, I also looked at many other studies of the gig economy. And what's interesting to note is the size of the gig economy depends very much on how you define it. So when we say the gig economy, if you just mean people on gig platforms like Uber, TaskRabbit, that's a very small part of the overall economy. In fact, by one estimate, one out of every 200 US workers have their primary job on some sort of gig platform. 10% have their primary job as some sort of job that I would describe as a gig economy job. And what do I mean by that? I mean not just being on Uber, I mean being an independent contractor, being some sort of you know, uh, moonlighter, any, uh, moonlighter, sorry, would not be your primary job, but being a freelancer and something like that. However, that's a small part of the overall gig economy because most people who work in the gig economy have another job. They have a regular job and they drive for Uber on the side. Even when I'm not driving for Uber, I'm a member of the gig economy because once in a while I'll take on a consulting project. So I have a main job and then I have an independent contractor job. So when you include those people, you're talking about 30% of the US workforce has some sort of job. Now this has been growing and because of technology making it easier for people to be free agents and other trends that I'll talk about, the size of the independent workforce has grown substantially. In fact, in a paper by some other economists, they estimated that between 2005 and 2015, all of the growth in the US labor force was in something you might call the gig economy, okay? All of the growth. So the, the regular employment stayed steady in terms of numbers, and the growth was all on the gig economy side. This is, a, this is from the paper I, read, I did for Upwork, and I don't want you to look at all the numbers carefully. Don't worry about that. I just want to make the point that I, in that paper, compared people who work in the independent workforce to all other employees. And the thing to notice, if you did have time to look through this slide, is that the independent workforce, those who work in some way in the gig economy, are surprisingly representative of the economy as a whole. We think of independent workers as sort of Uber drivers and temps and low skilled workers going from gig to gig. Actually, a lot of people at all skill levels are members of the gig economy in one form or another. So, um, you know, so for example, the guy who mic'd me up, I was talking to him, he, he's an employee for Stanford, half time, and then he's also in the gig economy because he does gigs for various other places around here where people need to be mic'd up and other things that have that same set of skills. So, you know, he's a relatively skilled person. A lot of us who work in the gig economy are. You know, there are unskilled people as well. So the distribution turns out to be surprisingly similar whether you're looking at the, for people in the gig economy to people in the broader economy. The other thing is, I get a little bit annoyed by news accounts that equate working in the gig economy with exploitation. There's kind of a feeling that, oh, we're just exploiting all these people who have nothing to do but work on Uber. 
We have lots of problems in the United States with regards to low level or low skilled workers. And you know, there, there's a lot we need to do to address that. I don't think the gig economy is, a pro, is really the issue there. It might be a little bit of an effect of that, I'll talk about that, a result of that, but it's not driving it. People who work in the gig economy make less on a per year basis, but that's because they're working fewer hours. On a per hour basis, they actually make more at, by, uh, by my best estimates. It's hard to say exactly for various reasons. My best estimates are that per hour they make 15% more than those who have regular jobs. Now they have to make more just to break even because they have to pay their own social security tax, they don't get benefits and things like that. But at least they're not being exploited in a way that their pay is much lower. And in fact, if you're working in the gig economy by choice, rather than because you can't find a job that you want in a regular employer, you have even a higher premium to working independently. And those, there, most of the gig economy are people who work there because they want to, not because they can't get a real job or something like that. And that's especially true now. If you ask people in the gig economy in 2009, are you working this gig job because you want to or because you have to, in 2009 when unemployment is 10, 12%, the answer is because I have to. If you ask them, anybody who wants a job right now can have one. And so the people working in the gig economy want to be working in the gig economy. And they are making a premium relative to what they would be earning for a similar, people with similar skills in the uh, rest of the economy. So this is just some distributions. You can see the gig economy workers are in green. This is the distribution. This is, uh, I know it's been a long time since you took data and decisions here at the GSB. This is a distribution of hours per week by people in the gig economy in the green line and people in the regular, in regular traditional jobs in the red line. You can see that the distribution is much more spread out for people in the gig economy, whereas they tend to be more sort of 40 hours or something close to that. But so that there's more flexibility and value in that, but the pay turns out to be very similar overall. Their lumpiness in this is a little because of the way the survey set up. I won't get into the details, but the point is that the pay is pretty similar across the two groups. Okay, I did. I've looked at a lot of surveys of of the gig economy, of various people being asked who work in the gig economy, why do you work in the gig economy? And I've taken all the answers to these surveys, thousands of answers, and I've. I've done a really detailed text analysis of this, and I've got like this fancy algorithm and text, big data algorithm to figure it out. And I took all my computing resources available, and I created the following word cloud that really technically gets at what people are looking for. <laughs> okay, that's it. If you ask somebody, why do you work in the gig economy? It's, occasionally it's because I have to, I can't find uh, the job I'm looking for. But in the majority of cases, they say, I want the flexibility. Flexibility comes in many dimensions. It can be, I want to take this week off. I want to get my kids to school. I want to be able to do this and that. But flexibility really drives it. And so technology's enabled a lot of people to become free agents, to live much more flexible work lives. And so that's the very positive side of the gig economy. Now, by the same token, I could do the same word cloud thing and say, well, what don't you like about the gig economy? And again, there, there's just one answer, instability. If I work in the gig economy, next week I might not get the guy in the back who's doing my mic, I have to say nice things about him or he'll shut me off. He, if, if he suddenly next week, those venues he's working at have a slow week, that's gonna hit his earnings more than other people. And I, you know, that can be problematic. So I don't know about him in particular, but for a lot of gig workers, this is a bit of an issue. For a lot, it's not. Either they have a spouse who earns a more steady income, or they have enough in savings that they can buffer those things over a period of time. So, and in fact, I used, I'm, I was very careful to use the word instability and not risk. I'm not convinced that it's higher risk to work in the gig economy. It's, it's more unstable month to month, week to week, but the beauty of the gig economy is the downsides are small. If you have a bad week or two, you know, you can bounce back. If the economy dips for a while, you lose 25% of your business. If you're in a regular job and the economy dips, there's a low probability that you get hit with a very bad shock, which is to lose your job entirely. 
So on the total risk, I'm not that worried about the gig economy workers. But from the variation, it's definitely a, a cost, as it were, of working in the gig economy. I teach a class here at the uh, GSB with a guy some of you may know, everybody in the Bay Area knows, and uh, since you're GSB alums, you probably know him, uh, you, may, you may know him, a guy named Lenny Mendoza. He and I teach a class here on uh, inequality in the United States for MBAs. And in that, when you talk about inequality, a lot of people want to talk about the gig economy, as I mentioned, because they feel like it's people who are exploited. And it's not immediately obvious that the gig economy is making inequality worse. I think it might be a little bit of an outcome of inequality. But here I can give you just a little sense for that. So I already gave you a sense for it with the Uber driver. The Uber driver is, is smoothing out inequality to some degree because he's taking money from a rich area, which is the Bay Area, and moving it back to Sacramento. That does, that's a very small, going a very small way to undoing some of, the, some of the forces that are leading to greater inequality in the United States. But on Upwork, you see what's going on there is it's also lowering inequality, but in a different way, not quite in the same way. So these numbers are, again, a little hard to uh, see, maybe, but let me just tell you what they say. If I go on the Upwork site, so what is, what is the buyers on the Upwork site are companies or small businesses that are looking for someone to do search engine optimization work, web development work, translation, things like that. If I look at the zip code where those people who are buying services are, they're very rich zip codes. So to be a little more specific, the average income in the zip code of a buyer on uh, the Upwork site is 36% greater than the average income for the United States as a whole. So these are rich zip codes. There are also even more outliers on things like education. The sellers, on the other hand, are very middle class incomes. So for example, on the income side, the average income in a zip code of somebody who is selling their services on Upwork is 15% above the average in the United States. So it's, up, it's a little above, middle of, above the middle. And so the point is, what is a site like Upwork doing for inequality in the US? It's helping a little. It's taking money from rich neighborhoods and pushing it to middle class neighborhoods. It's not doing anything for poor neighborhoods. Nobody, not nobody, but relatively few people from poor neighborhoods are offering their services on Upwork. However, we're a global school. We were happy to take a global perspective on this. Upwork is actually doing, as does immigration or trade of any immigration and more broadly global trade does, Upwork is doing a fair amount to equalize or to undo some inequality across the world. Why? Because guys like Alexi, who come from poor countries, earn a lot more than they otherwise would, and they're getting their money from rich countries. In Upwork, there's just a ton of people doing work in the Philippines and India. That's really bringing up the, really having, at least on a one-by-one -one level, if not countrywide level, helping a lot with bringing up lower class countries like that. So the gig economy, and in particular globalizing it through sites like Upwork, has the potential to help undo inequality on a small scale. We're not going to solve the problems that way by any means, but on a small scale it can contribute. When I think of inequality and the gig economy, here's the thing where I think we have a real problem. And that's not, these people aren't even gig economy workers, but they get sort of treated like them. They get bunched in with them. People who have on-demand jobs, this to me is a much bigger problem. So the Uber driver may not make a lot of money, the one on the left, she's an, she's, uh, an Uber driver. She may not make a ton of money, but she makes a decent living, she has total flexibility, she works when she wants to, everything is at her, dis her choice. So in terms of whether she's contributing to inequality, I don't know, but at least she's earning money and we don't have to think about the conditions of her life. One of the problems with techno technology's enabled that flexibility for Uber drivers. It's also enabled inflexibility. How's it done that? Starbucks has gotten better about this, so it's a little unfair for me to show you a Starbucks picture because they've tried to undo this. But a lot of employers are getting much better at figuring out their demand for workers on a very short-term basis. So they'll call people the night before and say, you have to be here at 9 o'clock tomorrow. That's very costly to a worker. Right, so the, the Uber driver has total flexibility. The person working at Starbucks or whatever companies are still doing this, on-demand workers, 
We see a low wage in that job, but if you sort of thought of it in terms of overall happiness of their job, it's even worse. Because the cost to them of these jobs are very high. They have to find babysitters at the last minute. They have to do all sorts of other, they have to do other things. So this, I think, is more of a problem than, than the uh, other thing. So let me talk about one more thing related to inequality, and then, and then I'll move on to uh, uh, more managerial topics. This is a graph from a paper written by uh, a bunch of people. One of the authors is Nick Bloom, who's my colleague here in the Stanford Economics Department. And so what they did is, so let me ask you, before I show you the graph, if anybody figured it out from that graph already, congratulations. You were an R.J. Miller scholar, probably. And so um, what, what I want you to do is, what I want you to think about is the following. Do you think that the increase in inequality we've seen in the United States over the last 30 years is more because inequality has grown within firms? That is, CEOs are making more than line workers. That difference has grown within firms? Or do you think it's more because across firms? So the CEO or the middle managers of one company compared to the CEOs and the middle managers of the other company? Well, it turns out it's entirely across firms. So that's what this graph was showing you. So if you look, you can, the top, let's just focus on the yellow line at the top. That shows you the percentage increase in the top 1% of all workers in the United States in the top left. Up there, it shows you the same thing, but done at a firm average level. So I take the top, the average pay at the top 1% paying firms. And the growth in those firms has been exactly the same as the top for all workers in individually. So another way of thinking about this is the inequality that you've seen over the last 30 years is because at Stanford, you know, I've, I've had, Stanford professors have had administrative assistance for that whole time. The multiplier between our pay has been steady the whole 30 years, okay? But if you look at, if you compare my pay to an economist at Foothill College where the pay rates are lower, my salary has gone up quite a bit relative to that other person. Why does that matter? Well, why does that matter to the gig economy? What's happening is you see a lot of big firms that are very successful, Apple, Google, uh, you know, Stanford probably to some degree. They're very successful and they say, okay, every, you know, our, we have a lot more money, we're sharing it with everybody at the firm. Why are, why are we sharing it with people who, we, you know, why are we paying a lot more to our food service workers and to our janitors. And those people get shunted out of these companies. So you see a lot more outsourcing as we go over time and as pay, in, pay disparities between firms have grown and, and firms don't want to take the top, the bottom level with them as the salaries within those firms grow. So a lot of those workers end up in the gig economy. Now that doesn't mean they then become free agents and they do okay, but the point is, that part of what's made the gig economy grow is this extension of inequality and therefore wanting to make free agents out of people who aren't core to the business. All right, let me change gears and talk about, so I'm, I'm giving a talk at the Stanford GSB and nothing's changed since you guys graduated. Well, looking out at you, what, like 10 years ago, something like that. And so not much has changed here at the GSB. I am still contractually obligated to show you a two by two matrix in every talk that I give. So I've followed through on that. So I like to segment the market for, for independent work along two dimensions. Along the, uh, along the vertical axis, I have online versus offline. The online part is actually still a very small part of this. Uber is huge, you know, Upwork's pretty big, you've heard of these companies, but there's still a ton of stuff that's just done offline. And this is where the microphone guy, Andy, I think his name is, comes in. He's still doing all these, uh, he's doing this work for these other uh, venues where he puts on mics and does other sound work at those places. He gets those gigs by contacts that call him at those places. He doesn't go on some website. That's all going to move from right to left. That stuff will all get done online over time. That's just a matter of slowness and technology taking over and old networks working the way they are. So we know where that's going. The Ubers are taking, and that sort of thing is taking over. To me, the more important issue is the horizontal axis. So I want to ask you to go through, to consider the following thought experiment. Put yourself back in the year 2005. So I want you to forget everything you've learned in the last 12 years. 
Now I know a lot of GSB students and I know it's not hard for them to forget things they've learned very quickly. So you, I want you to go ahead and do that. So go back to 2005 and suppose somebody came to you with the following two options. Would you like to invest in a company that's going to, uh, that we want to build out into a big online freelancing platform for software developers and translators and things like that? Or would you like to invest in a company that's going to enter the ride sharing business where people are gonna drive each other around in their own cars? And I think if you're honest with yourself, you would say I'd go with the online labor platform or Upwork. I wouldn't have invested in Uber. Well, obviously, you would have been, in hindsight, we all would have been wrong had we made that decision. And if you stop and think about why, it actually becomes apparent that it's just simple economics or labor economics. And why, why would I say that? Well, what's going on on Uber turns out to be what I call commoditized matching in the gig economy. What does that mean? It means an Uber is an Uber. Uber sets you up with somebody, they tell you, here's your match, the person shows up and they drive you away. And sure, when I described it a minute ago and you were, if you were a venture capitalist, it sounded funny, their own cars and all that, but when people realized that you were taking a product they knew really well, which was the taxi, and you were doing it better and cheaper, it wasn't very hard for them to say, okay, sign me up for that, and we all started driving around uh, in other people's cars very quickly. So that commoditized matching be, has very low friction. You somebody in the middle just assigns you, you show up with the car, and off you go. The key is the intermediary, the platform, assigns your car, your driver, and it all works very well. Why have the likes of Upwork and uh, Catalint, which is a place to match MBAs to gig-type consulting projects, why have those been slower to, f to catch on? Because there's a lot more friction in the labor market if all I do is introduce you. These sites introduce you to a set of people, and then you have to go through all the trouble of vetting them, negotiating with them, figuring out who's who and whatnot. So what you've done is, instead of taking something we all understand, which is the taxi, and making it better and cheaper, you've taken something we all understand, which is hiring people, and you've made it difficult and weird and different than it used to be. And it's not worse. Over time, we're going to get there. We're going to learn how to hire online, and we're going to get better at distance learning, at distance hiring. But it's going to be slower, and it may not take over the market for employees in the same way that Lyft and Uber have completely taken over the market for taxis. So why would you ever employ somebody from the gig economy? Well, the big advantages are, one is what I call labor arbitrage. If you can have somebody in the Ukraine do a job instead of somebody in Silicon Valley, that saves you a lot of money. So obviously you want to do that. Choice, I'm going to come back to in a minute. Faster onboarding, but the bottom two, a lot of you have small companies out there. And I would tell you that you guys should be more on the forefront than the big companies in hiring gig workers. Why? Because the fact that hiring gig workers makes it easier for you to downsize or re get or change the workers, the workforce skill you have, and the fact that you can hire partial workers. You only need a half of an SEO specialist. You can do that through the gig economy. Hiring regular workers, you don't have these same sorts of advantages. And so the ability to be much more nimble, I mean, a lot of you have startups. Every one of you has done four pivots in the, in the, in the process of running your business. And therefore, you need a different set of skills. Having more flexible gig workers for a lot of those jobs, not for all of them, but for a lot of those jobs, makes those pivots a lot easier. You can get rid of people you don't need anymore, bring on people you do, and you can hire people for partial jobs. If you happen to be a gig platform, this means that small companies are a big growth opportunity for you, because if you get into current startups, they're the ones who, if they get, the, the thing that's keeping big companies from from figuring out how to solve those frictions I was talking about is just they're, they're stuck in their old ways. But smaller companies, as they scale, are going to be much better at breaking down that friction, hiring remotely, and doing all the things that will make the gig economy bigger. So if you have a gig platform, this is a big growth opportunity. Get in on the startups now, and as they scale and need more people, they will remain able to take advantage of the advantages you have to offer. I mentioned that I would tell you about choice. What's another really good thing about the gig economy is it just opens up the possibilities to you. So Alexi, 
and other people like him, not only are they cheaper, but they deepen the pool of potential software developers dramatically. Here in Silicon Valley, that's not such a big deal. This cost savings are a big deal. We have plenty of software engineers around. But in a lot of places, suppose you were, you know, suppose you were in Chicago, or uh, a better thing would be, suppose you were in Lawrence, Kansas, a town of 25,000 people with a few hundred software developers, well, you're kind of hiring off that boardwalk over there. So you're, there's all these software engineers. If you think of all the potential people you could hire as spreading out along a boardwalk, and the people right in the middle are perfect for you, and at one end are those who don't have quite the right skills for one reason, at the other end are those who don't have quite the right skills for another, where do you want to be hiring from? You want to be hiring from a very crowded boardwalk. And if you live in Silicon Valley, just every, you just walk out the door and there's a ton of software engineers. And there's plenty who will fit the exact need you need. Find, getting them to come work for you is a difficult problem, but at least there will be plenty available. But if you're in Lawrence, Kansas, there's nothing out there. So what do you do? Well, this is a picture from Upwork. If you, the, the, if you only want to hire in your area, of course, you just have the people who are in your area. But if you were in Chicago or Lawrence, Kansas, or wherever you are, you suddenly have 20,000 additional software developers available to you who are thousands and thousands of miles away. So if you're in a smaller area, or even in Chicago, which doesn't quite have as thick a market for software engineers, the, these, online, uh, these online platforms provide a much thicker, a much more crowded boardwalk for you. And there's a lot of value in that. Now you have to re you have to change the way you hire people and the way you work people into your company, but it's something that at least creates a lot of value for you. I want to change gears slightly for about five minutes and then spend my last five minutes before I take questions talking about strategies. Claudia Golden is a Harvard economist, best, probably the leading authority in economics on male-female pay differentials. And she said. The converging roles of men and women are among the grandest advances in society and the economy in the last century. Women have really caught up in the workplace is what that means. I'm, I'm, I'm going to translate once in a while. And so what she says is that the gender gap in pay would be considerably reduced and might vanish altogether if firms did not have an incentive to disproportionately reward individuals who labored long hours and worked particular hours. And so there's another word in there she mentions that jobs are structured and remunerated to enhance temporal flexibility. If you make the job more flexible, women will do better, was the underlying hypothesis of this and many other predictions about the gig economy. So that's what we're studying at Uber. We went into Uber and we said, OK, well, there's no discrimination here. The algorithm is gender blind. And so women and men are going to make the same here, right? Well, it doesn't turn out to be that simple. This is pay on Uber uh, per hour. These are hourly earnings for Uber drivers over the last couple of years. And what you can see is there's a pretty steady 5% uh, steady pay gap between them. Men driving for Uber make about a dollar an hour or about 5% more than women driving for Uber. Okay? Now, I'm not going to cold call anybody because, you know, it's reunions. You're, you're just here to have fun. But anybody want to take a guess as to why? Why do men make more? I do not have a good direct test of that hypothesis. She said, for those of you who are, in the, who are out there, I'm supposed to be using microphones, but these will be quick answers. She said bathroom breaks. To my knowledge, that is not the answer. By the way, as an Uber driver and a man, I can say, if that's true, I'm not contributing to the male differential. But that's another story. Men drive faster was the next guess. That's one of them. Got another one? Drive to the surge areas. OK. Men are more responsive to making more money. It's not that they drive more to the surge areas. It's that they work more when there is surge on, whereas women want to work when their kids are in school, when whatever it is. OK. One more reason. Anybody know one more reason? Exactly. Right. Yep, OK, but there's a third reason. Men, men drive into more riskier areas. 
Ah, that's kind of, I'll come back to that in a second. Let me show you the answer. It's not tip. Somebody said tips. This is all before Uber had tips. And I have not yet gotten a tip, so as far as I can tell, that's not that relevant. <laughs> um, so it's a little bit, we wrote this paper, we started writing this paper purely expecting it to be the thing about men drive when it's, are willing to drive when it's less safe. They'll drive on the weekends when people are more likely to puke in your car. I had some graphics for that. I took them out. <laughs> and we thought it was going to be more about this work while your kids are in school thing. That's a very small part of it. This is the entire 168 hours of the week, from midnight on Sunday to the next Sunday at midnight. And this is what fraction of each hour of their time are being driven by men versus women. If you look at this carefully, and I won't go in, there's a little bit of a difference where men are driving the dangerous hours and women are driving more during school hours. But that turns out to explain a very small part of the wage gap. The, you got the third explanation. I'll come back to speed. The second one that nobody mentioned is it turns out, and this is true of other labor markets, one of the innocuous, non-discriminatory reasons, well, you can tell a discrimination story, but one of the reasons men make more in a lot of labor markets holds on Uber, too. It's that they work more, and you learn on the job and get better at it. The average man on Uber has driven, I don't know, I'll make up a number, 1,000 trips. The average woman driver on Uber has only driven 500. Turns out, this is earnings per this is the average earnings for your first trip up to the average earnings for your 5,000th trip. And you can see there's quite a bit of a learning curve. Among other things, you learn where the quick in and out bathrooms are and other things along those lines. And then finally, there's the uh, other answer that men just drive faster. So what does this tell you? This is, uh, now this is truly from data and decisions. That's the bell distribution of driving speed. And the blue, which is men, is out and to the right. That means, for those of you who didn't do well in D&D, &D, that means that they drive faster. Okay? So what does this tell us? It tells us that Uber and the gig economy provide flexibility, but that while that's, that can be the great equalizer in terms of utility and in terms of making your life easier if you're a woman, it's not going to be the great equalizer on a per hour of work dollar basis. It does, flexibility doesn't necessarily get rewarded in the labor market. And at Uber and at other places, we see that. So as a result, the, the women who drive on Uber and work on other gig sites are very happy for the flexibility, but they don't necessarily get, it's not changing the wage premium in a way that, that undoes the biases that come from certain attributes of our labor market. So let me spend the last few minutes talking about, as managers, what does any of this mean to you? Well. These are the things all of you who employ people know that those are the key components of your labor costs. So how does the gig economy help you? Well, one way it can help you is you can just move your money, you can move your employees from Denver to the Ukraine if you can offshore them, and that's what we call labor arbitrage. Another thing is if you just, have, if you just want to ramp up a job quickly, getting somebody in through the gig economy can be very, very quickly done and very economically done. And that lowers the amount of vacancies, and it lowers your hiring costs, all of which, as you know, can be very expensive. If you're a startup, you don't want to hire somebody who you don't have enough work for. So if you hire a part of person through the gig economy, that can pay off very well. But the problem is you're hiring a group of people who are, by definition, transient. These people are leaving anytime they want to. They're free agents. That's what they value. So, Using them strategically can be very beneficial, but you have to think of it as very only those parts of your business where you want to be transactional. So I've talked about data and decisions in other classes. Let me remind you of your core strategy class. Uh, I'm going to skip this slide. Com remember, your business, if your business is successful, it's because you have a competitive advantage. Right? If you run a business, say to yourself, what is my competitive advantage? What do I have in the way of a capability, resource, or position that's unusual, that's hard for other people to get? And if you don't have a good answer to that question, by the way, you should start looking at a new business model. But if you do have an answer to that question, often it can come down to, I have certain capabilities that are invested in certain people. Well, if that's true, 
you don't want to go too far on this whole gig economy transactional thing because those people are not your comp If somebody is it's hired in through the gig economy, they cannot by definition be part of your competitive advantage, okay? I'm going to skip the example of Walmart and, uh, and whether people can be a competitive advantage because I just want to point out competitive advantage is about differentiation. Independent workforce is about undifferentiation. It's about very transactional uh, commoditized labor markets. You should not be hiring any worker through any sort of gig economy type arrangement if that job involves creating or maintaining your competitive advantage. You should be doing it because of labor arbitrage, because you need a skill temporarily to scale up or down quickly, but you should certainly not be doing it. You should absolutely stop before hiring someone through a gig economy job and say, is this something I need? Is this something that sets me apart? Or another way of doing it, I like to, um, I, I usually don't like sort of five things you can do to change your business type, uh, type things. But I, will wanna, I do want to leave you with a checklist before you go hire somebody off the gig economy. Ask yourself, can I get this same skill cheaper and further away, in which case you do maybe want to think about going into the gig economy. Ask yourself, is it okay if the person isn't here very long? And if the answer is no, you definitely don't want to go into the free agent world of the gig economy. Is there a good chance I'm going to want to get rid of this person? Do they have some specialized skill, not because they're bad or something, but because my needs will change? Does this person have a specialized skill? In that case, sure, free agents are good if they come in and give you some skill you need and that everybody else needs as well. Do I just want part of a person? That's when the gig economy can make a lot of sense. And am I looking for a skill that's very scarce and that I'm, like others, just need some of the time and it doesn't set me apart? Then sure, you want to go through the gig economy. So let me just wrap up, and then I'll be happy to stay and discuss questions about this or online dating or anything you want to talk about. So far, the impact of the gig economy has actually been pretty small. If you read the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, or if you do what I did, I went to a conference recently for temporary help work and spoke there. There, they don't think the impact is small. But if you look in broadly in the economy, the impact of the gig economy is still pretty small. But it's growing, and it's growing pretty quickly. And the reason for that is, a lot of it can make the economy run more, more efficiently, and technology is allowing it to be more and more that way. A lot of people have preferences for flexibility that are enhanced nicely by it. There's a lot of potential downsides, volatility. I shouldn't have said risk. I told you I wouldn't say that. But volatility, people feel like they're second class status, and you know whether or not there's in it inequality issues is a different question. But I think as managers, you should think, especially if you're at a small company, about the, strategic, the sort of ways you can use this strategically. And if you're small and growing, you might think about building in a comparative advantage relative to some of your big competitors, uh, a comparative advantage around being able to be very flexible and to quickly up and down scale and bring on skills that other companies can't. So with that, I'm going to leave you. Uh, that's my Twitter handle where, um, you know, with this room, I could easily improve my followers by about 17 times, so go sign up. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much. I'd be happy to take some questions. I am, told, I am told that it's very important that you wait for a microphone before you speak, because our audience at home uh, wants to be able to hear you. Does somebody so my have... question is as follows. Ah. When you put up that slide originally showing that I think it's 15% of the economy is going gig, so to speak. The first thing that ran through my head was, what's going to happen in 20 years, 30 years, when all these people don't have health care? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, a lot of, so the, as the gig economy grows, there have to be some public policy reactions to it. I would argue, as an economist, that on the list of issues we have to deal with in healthcare, the role of the gig economy is about 38th on that list. So I'm not that worried about that just because I think we have to do so many things with regards to healthcare over the next 10 years that its effect on the gig economy is just another of the many issues that it has. I absolutely agree. I mean, the exchanges and whatnot would obviously go along. That's how people are dealing with it. The other way they're dealing with it is a lot of gig workers have spouses with health insurance. 
So those are the two ways we're dealing with it now. As this grows, you're absolutely right. Uh, but you know, just there are so many other. It's oh, I, I mean, I don't want to talk about healthcare because we'll get sort of depressed <laughs> and whatnot. Next, who's got the mic? Nobody up there. I yeah. love the people who like they come back and they're like, I'm at reunion. I got to sit in the sky deck no matter what. But we don't have any mics up there. Sorry. So one question. Um, Will this, at some point, have repercussions also for what I would call very skilled workers? So let's say a head of growth, a senior director in product management, a, a chief marketing officer who says, you know what, I actually just want to do two or three at the same time, but at scale. And as sort of the lateral question to that, um, would we then see something that goes even beyond this individual engagement and assignment where these people will start bringing mini teams depending on what they need with them and sort of we will have a little bit the podification of work, right, where you have these micro masses of enterprises or, or small enterprises playing? Everything you just described already exists in at least experimental form. So let me tell you two company names. I, I'm, I don't mean to shill for anybody here, but two companies I happen to have been introduced to recently that are going down this line. Exactly. One is just called TopTal. You can figure out the derivation of that name, hopefully. And they're just putting together, they're just looking at free agents, people who want to earn the kinds of money that you would work, make as a software engineer at a company, but they just want to work independently, either from home or whatever, and they want either one temporary gig or a bunch at one time. And they're making more money than they can make as employees, and they really like it. Now, they can't work on the most exciting thing happening. It can't quite be top towel. If what I said was right about competitive advantage, it can't quite be top towel. It has to be really high towel, but not quite top towel. And the reason for that is the top guys have to be your competitive advantage. If they're not, if the guy on the web at top towel is your competitive advantage, it's not going to work. But business models very close to what you're talking about exist. Another company out there is called Business Talent Group, I believe, and they want to their claim is that they're going to disrupt McKinsey. So they're trying to put together virtual teams from around the world that will uh, work on projects where they are. And you know they'll just grow over the internet. So those, those things are happening. I wouldn't say anybody's really, I wouldn't say anybody's really nailed that business model yet, but they're, they're trying, and it'll happen. Who has a, does some, anybody have a mic? So what's the difference between outsourcing and the second category of your gig economy? Which was the second category of my gig economy? I don't know. You had the upper one and the lower one. It's the guy, it's the guy in, uh, in Europe. Oh, what's the difference between outsourcing and that? It is. That's outsourcing. You're yeah. outsourcing your and outsourcing, software development. Right, it's, and outsourcing has been around for 30 years. Agreed. So the difference is it's growing. The gig economy is about growing outsourcing. The num like I said, people have been doing independent work for time immemorial. This is just a matter of technologies making it easier than it ever was, and it's just growing a part of the business. The other big difference is, here's one other big difference. In the old days, you outsourced to a company. You still do that a lot. We outsource to a food service company. But you, now we also outsource to individuals like Alexi for individual projects. That you didn't do in the old days because it just wasn't as easy to find those people. You did some of it, of course. But the, the ease with which it's done has grown and will grow more. That matching process will get better and better. Who's Yes, thank you. Part of the um, reason people go to work is not only for uh, the salary, direct salary, but it's what you call the uh, benefits on the side, which can be very substantial. Unemployment benefit, health cover, and so on and so on and so on. Yeah. Um, the gig economy takes that away from people, right? I suspect. Uh, it does, for the so most part. So you, you are basically creating, or you're talking about creating an... an um, a society where everybody's at risk every day uh, for the rest of their life on no social safety net uh, protection whatsoever. Wow, that was kind of a downer way of putting it, but... <laughs> <laughs> but it's totally, it's totally fair question. Uh, I, 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 
I agree. So how, where are the, un so this comes back to your question about healthcare. From a public policy perspective, so there's two ways to look at the gig economy. I would argue actually, you use the word safety net, I love that term. The gig economy is in many ways an alternative safety net. If you lose your job and you don't have all the benefits that you used to have, at least you can go drive for Uber to make a little bit of money and it's better than just taking unemployment. Now having said that, all those other benefits don't get made up for. And from a public policy perspective, we're gonna have to make those, we're gonna have to make it easier for people to be able to get those benefits on their own, either by buying healthcare in whatever, you know, you can already, the retirement stuff is pretty easy now already. You can go get the equivalent of a 401k plan, self-employment 401k plan and things like that. But absolutely, I mean, especially in the United States, we've always had sort of a free agent. The safety net hasn't been that great and it's not, this is not gonna make it any, any better. I agree with that. Um, you haven't spoken about um, any form of employee rights. Uh, in the end, uh, you can be cheated, you can be um, treated unfairly, and so on. This uh, gig economy is completely devoid of that. In Europe, there is a huge pushback against this um, right yeah. now, and I think um, you know you need to address that because I, I felt your talk was very much on on one side of the argument. I, I don't think there was balance in what you presented. Um, so I'd like you to balance it now. <laughs> so let me, let me address that in two ways. One is, again, if you ask most people why do you work in the gig economy, they say it's because they want to. So do they feel exploited? No, if you ask an Uber driver, does Uber treat you well? No, if you ask a taxi driver or somebody else who makes that much money and works for a company, do you feel exploited? They're probably as likely to say yes as if they don't work for Uber. So keeping, minimizing exploitation in the labor market is very, very important. I 100% agree. I haven't seen a lot of evidence yet that the exploitation, I'm, you know, the, the people who don't make much money in the United States are getting a raw deal right now. I'm happy to say that and in agreement with that, you'd be hard pressed not to agree with that. I don't think it's any worse if you're in the gig economy than if you make similar amounts of money and work for a company. You are a little, there are, I'm not gonna say there aren't situations like that. Certainly some gig companies won't pay people or will do something wrong, but they'll be thrown off the platforms or other ways that, that happen just as quickly. So, Am I sympathetic to the difficulties of low-skilled workers in the United States right now? Absolutely. Do I think the gig economy is any worse in that way than employers? I don't actually think so. I haven't seen any evidence to suggest that's the case. Uh, do you see any developments that could happen that would stop the growth of the gig economy? Policy implications, certainly. Uh, policy, policy things, you know, people were talking about various things they're trying to, the various sort of crackdowns on the gig economy in Europe, uh, where I think the growth has actually been just as good. And I mean, in some ways, in, in a place like Europe where, where policies tend to be more pro-employee friendly, on the one hand, there's pushback against the gig economy. On the other hand, the employers are pushing more and more for it because anything they can do to take someone on who's not an employee that they can later get rid of uh, is, is gonna make the gig economy look better. So that could go either way. But policy, I am very much a believer, there's a guy named Mark Warner in Virginia. He's the senator most involved in the policy side of the gig economy right now. And I think he's done some interesting things and taken some interesting steps in that direction. I, my view is we need to go slowly because there's always unintended consequences. So you want to allow the people who thrive in the gig economy to continue to thrive there. You don't want to put the brakes on them. But to the extent that anybody is getting exploited, you want policy to, to avoid that. And so we want to balance these things and take it somewhat slower. Um, you know, Mark Warner's not getting far on this. I don't know if anybody's noticed there's one or two other things going on in Washington these days. So the gig economy isn't quite front and center, but going forward, the thing that can really stop the growth of this is uh, if policies made, made it so that even people where it's a very good idea stop doing it. Yeah. 
Speaking of impacts on the gig economy, do you have any thoughts on automation of the gig economy, self-driving cars, machine learning algorithms taking over white collar labor? Yeah, so people seem to equate the gig economy with robots taking over. And these are two things, the, the, I don't equate them, but I do see why that happens because they're both driven by technical changes easing these things. So it's a separate, somewhat separate question that we, you know, John mentioned that a lot of people in Stanford generally are really worried about this. I spent this morning up at the Center for the Advanced Study in the Behavioral Science Sciences on a big cross-campus project we're doing, trying to think about the effects of autonomous vehicles on the economy. We haven't started worrying about the gig economy's role in all of that, but that's a really big question. I can give you my own view really quickly, but that's, you know, it's one, it, you could, if you chose a different labor economist, you get a different story. I'm less worried than everybody else is about the robots putting us all out of work. They're going to put a lot of people, sorry, real quickly, they're going to put a lot of people out of work, but if you go back in history, 200 years ago, we were all farmers. Nobody's a farmer anymore, and we still have jobs. Now, everybody says this time could be different, and someday they're going to be right when they say this. And so I wish this wasn't on camera, because you can make me look silly in 10 years, but I think I'm less worried about that than uh, a lot of people are. Yeah, last question. I'm curious if you've done any look at the impact on organizations that are dependent on employees, for example, workers' compensation insurance companies, 401k providers, group benefits. How fast is this going to happen? How quickly do they need to begin responding? I think the answer is it's happening. It's not happening so fast that it's like a threat and whatnot. But those companies, I've talked to a lot of them at conferences and stuff, and they are all worried about it and out in front of it and trying to do something about it. And I think they should be, and I think that's great. You should all be out in front of the trends in your market. You all know that. You went to the GSB. You've gotten this far because you've been ahead of the trends in your market. But absolutely, this is not just about gig economy. It's about the whole infrastructure behind employee benefits and all sorts of things. Thank you so much for coming today. Enjoy your weekend, and hope to see you around.